Okay, so uh, thanks Eminem for his uh, for her sharing. So uh, he come to, here come to another sections. So uh, we have a uh, Hugo, uh, who is the APIs and messaging developer advocate at Red Hat. So he is going to talk about the event driven API and schema governance for Apache Kafka. So uh, Hugo, how are you? Hello. Hey Patrick, yeah, pleasure yeah, to be with so you this year. Yeah, yeah, thanks for supporting us uh, again this year, and then uh, a good, good background as well. Okay, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's try to see your screen. Okay, I can see your screen here, and then your voice is uh, loud and clear. So I pass Perfect. the time to you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, so uh, again, it's a pleasure. Uh, thank you for being uh, with us in this event in API Days Live Hong Kong. It's a pleasure to be with you and being able to share with you some of the new things that are coming in the API space related to event-driven architecture, event-driven APIs, and the usage of Apache Kafka. And, and it's very interesting to have this uh, event called a data interchange, because one of the things that we usually tend to do while using this kind of technology that we will be talking today, it's uh, actually transfer data from one place to another, from one system to another. And that's why the schema governance with, when we are using Apache Kafka becomes so critical. But uh, let's first do some introductions. Um, as Patrick mentioned, my name is Ugo. I'm part of the APIs and integration team uh, here at Red Hat. And I'm uh, myself an open source uh, developer advocate. And, and, and we um, also do a lot of traveling. So I, I, I love history, travel, and I consider my food, uh, a food enthusiast. So here's my Twitter handler if you want to continue the conversation or um, know more about what we are doing in this space. So today we'll be covering three main uh, topics. So the first one is gonna be uh, talking a little more about whether uh, it's an event-driven API and what are the challenges when we are talking about the implementation using Apache Kafka. Then we're gonna be talking about uh, why the uh, contract-first approach, uh, it's something that we have been doing a lot in the, in the API um, side of the story, and we need to start applying to other uh, type of APIs. And finally, we are gonna be talking about uh, event schemas and uh, how can we use them as contracts and how important it's to have this central piece uh, of a software that becomes the center of the governance around the, uh, the schemas for our data. So let's uh, talk uh, first about event-driven APIs and modern applications. So today we have a very, um, a very interesting steer in, in the way that we are working with technology. And basically we have this kind of situation where we are creating new applications and these applications uh, needs to fulfill these three uh, different aspects. So the first one is that they need to be distributed. That means that the deployments need to be uh, to be done across not only different data centers, but even across different regions. And they need to be highly available and be able to coordinate and you know, have this unified version of, of the application. Then the second thing is that those applications needs to be decoupled. And when we're talking about the couple, it's not just the technology that they're using, like you know, microservices with different type of languages, but also they need to be decoupled in time. That means that sometimes applications will be generating data that will be consumed by applications that are not even online or that they're not even create, being created yet. So that's why we're be using a persistent store for our events so they're gonna be able to be consumed for uh, uh, far in, in, in the future. And those applications need to be highly connected. So that's why we said that any applications need to be able to connect with our systems because no application lives in the vacuum. And for that, I just mentioned we have different types of approach, right? So we have been working around microservices. We have been working around um, REST uh, HTTP APIs, mainly focusing on the uh, request response. But today we are gonna be talking more about events and why events become important. So remember, um, request response, it's a type of communication uh, between services that it's, um, it's uh, very easy to scale and works great for decoupling uh, in, in the language. But sometimes when we need to decouple in time, we will need to take you know, ownership of information and data 
through uh, different uh, channels. So that's why events become um, uh, a rise in, in, in the new kind of architectures that we are gonna see uh, with customers and with different organizations uh, coming on, on this. And uh, you certainly will be using a uh, message broker or event uh, boss for uh, getting your events uh, in, in shape. And one of the uh, most commonly used uh, solutions to implement this kind of event-driven architecture, it's of course Apache Kafka. So Apache Kafka is this project on the, the Apache uh, uh, Foundation that helps you um, to uh, integrate your solutions using uh, using the event store that it's highly uh, capable to you know uh, handle throughputs uh, that are very very high. So the problem when we are using Kafka is that suddenly we start to see that it gets too much Kafkaesque. So it gets start it starts to get a, a little bit complicated when we just when we used to uh, have Kafka just being used for your internal services, that was working great. But suddenly when you realize that you need to share the information on your topics with other teams uh, within the same organization or with uh, teams outside your organization, it, it becomes uh, a little bit more complicated because then you start to ask the traditional questions like, what is uh, what is the what is the documentation for this endpoint? Uh, what is the, the kind of data format that we are expecting uh, in in this topic? What is the the, the expected uh, contract that we'll be sending? What is the kind of validations that they need to do? And when we don't have those things clear, it becomes uh, an easy misunderstanding between the uh, teams that are creating uh, and and sharing this information. But it's not just that; it's also sometimes you need to have you know information on uh how do you access the infrastructure so how do you connect to your broker what's the type of security that you have uh what kind of events are going to be available and what is the compliance that you will be doing between publishers and consumers so you know that they will be sending events that will be consumed uh without trouble by by, by the, those consumers so uh, the idea is that if you don't cover these kind of uh of, of answers for for these questions then most of the time you will have problems with getting a uh, slow time to market or poor quality in your application. So that's why we try to avoid these kind of things using event-driven APIs and contract-first workflows. So if you have been doing APIs, as I imagine, because you are also joining this session, you certainly know that when we uh, say contract-first, we're uh, saying that we want to you know, have this specification, and, and, and the documentation that tells us how this, um, how the API and the endpoint is going to be working, and the idea of using contract first is that you will be able to first work independently because you will have an agreement upfront that you will be able to share with other teams, and that represents the information and and, and the contract that you will be uh, sharing with with the team. So that way you have this consistency that because you need to adhere to the contract, you know that uh, things needs to uh, fulfill these, uh, these, uh, these, these guidelines. So in these kind of things, you are able to then share with other people because it's it's a common document. It's uh, based most of the times on the specification and you know that they will be able to use, uh, you know, things like generators to, you know, bootstrap their applications or tooling for mocking and, and testing. So. In the uh, REST uh, world, we have been doing this for a long time, right? So if you're doing an API, you know that there's a very uh, nice specification called Open API that allows you to um, specify how your REST API will uh, will be uh, uh, behaving. You have um, uh, tooling like Apicurio that will give you a very nice editor, and you will have something like Microx, for example, that helps you to do uh, API mocking and API testing using the exact same specification to do these kind of validations. But when we're talking about Kafka, when we're talking about uh, event-driven APIs, uh, sometimes this starts to get blurry. We don't exactly know how to get started. And that's why there's one secret weapon that we can't use for that. And that secret weapon, it's actually a sync API. If you haven't heard about a sync API, a sync API is this um, new specification that uh, has been joining the, uh, the Linux Foundation. It's an open source uh, initiative that 
uh, started a couple of years ago, and it's a sister uh, specification to open uh, to open API. So it was it was heavily influenced by, by, by open API. But the idea of this specification is to actually focus on the event driven API. So uh, open API, it's it's very it's highly rest uh, rest focused. But then when we're talking about event driven APIs and we're trying to resolve the problems that we that we uh, just talked before. Uh, there was some pieces missing, and that's why a sync API comes into play, and it starts to uh, you know work on how can we use the same approach to define this kind of of, of APIs. And the sync API has um, this um, focus on being protocol agnostic. So at the beginning, say okay, what kind of even driven APIs? So they cover different type of protocol from MQP, MQTT. Um, WebSockets, uh, Storm, GMS, and obviously Kafka. That's one that we will be covering today. And they just, uh, they, it's not, they are doing not just the specification and uh, because it is not just a software that you can install, they do provide some tooling that you can use for uh, for your schema and for your, uh, your implementation. So you can have this uh, nice playground, code generators, editors for mocking and testing and, and such. So in that way, what we can have is this view of unified contracts that go from the traditional REST API, where you are doing like a post for a register uh, user, and then you can move easily with the exact same definition of your payload from the, um, uh, from the REST API to the uh, event-driven API, for example, using uh, that for registering or just generating events of the user registration in a specific topic. And for that, we will be using a sync API. If we go in depth on the uh, on the anatomy of, uh, of the sync API, you will see that it covers very similar uh, uh, ground as, as the open API. You have some uh, information metadata, you have information on where are your servers, so you will have certainly some host names and Instead of having uh, you know paths, you will have channels uh, and and the different operations for those channels like publish and subscribe. You have the information of the metadata from for that channel that will be similar to what we have in the uh, in the paths for for uh, for uh, Open API. And the important thing here is that you will also have the information of the the structure of the message. So it is important to say that the structure of the message uh, refers to how the uh, the the, uh, the work the payload actually of the event that you will be receiving in that API uh, uh, should uh, look like. So you will certainly try to define that as a JSON schema or an Avro type of payload. And if you have been working with Kafka before, you will see that these are the same ways that we use for like example uh doing the uh schema registry for our avro pay, uh, payload or our uh json schemas or our google product buff, uh you know, protocol buffers so that's why we say that then schemas become the event contracts so now that we see that we need to define up front this, the, the payload that we will be using for our events, because we also need to serialize them and be able to deserialize for, by, the, by the consumer, then you have this concept of, uh, of a contract. And the important thing here is that the contracts then become something that is gonna be useful for your producers and for your consumers, not only during the time that you're building your application, but also can be useful during runtime. So let's see an example. Um, most of the times when you're just working uh, with your uh, with your team and you're having this application that is producing events that are then being sent to Kafka to different topics, uh, you will be able to serialize the information with certain structure because remember we just store um, by the race and then store them to Kafka. And the, because your team is also creating the consumers for those topics, they will be able to retrieve that information and you will be able to easily deserialize. But if you suddenly realize that your topic uh, gets uh, has information that is useful for other teams, they might want to you know be able to join that uh, that uh, topic and be become consumers of the information that you are generating. For example, if your uh, producer is using change data capture with DBSU to send events from your 
Oracle database, and then you will have a different consumers trying to get information from that database. Uh, when you're having the exact same uh, table structure, it will be super easy for them to you know, consume and deserialize uh, using the old schema. But what happens when suddenly you do a change in your uh, data table, and then suddenly this, the events that are being generated by Debezium while reading your, uh, your Oracle database will change. And if you control the consumers or you're able to you know, call the other team and say, okay, we just did this change, we need to upgrade your, uh, your deserializer, your version of the schema, so you're able to you know, consume those events, um, it, it can become burden to just share that information. And if they don't upgrade and suddenly you have you know, con all consumers using the, uh, the old version, perhaps the first ones will be, you know, okay, we can now get the, uh, the new version, but the last one, will certainly tend to crash and then burn. So you want to avoid these kind of things. So what do we need to do that? So how can we address these problems on the, on the data schema governance with your uh, with your Apache Kafka? So first remember the Apache Kafka is not aware of the data types or the schema formats. They just read uh, a, a byte array. So uh, APIs, uh, API schemas are subject to change because your data will certainly change. So that's why we need a central the concept of the central registry where the data schemas can be stored and be accessible. So that's why it's super important when you're doing your uh, schema governance with uh, Apache Kafka to you know, uh, work with this concept of the registry for even schemas. And the idea of this uh, central piece of your architecture is to have this kind of, um, of usage for this, uh, for this schema management. So, uh, again, we do have our producer and our consumer that will need to serialize and deserialize the uh, data that is flowing through your uh, Kafka topic. But in this case, before we are sending information, we can use this um, concept of the registry to then check uh, before we are sending information, uh, what is the structure that we need to use for sending our, our event. And if we are using a sync API, that will be already defined as part of the uh, of the contract, right? So you will be able to see, okay, for topic A, a we have this other type of serialization, then we're able to send information using that specific structure. And then the consumer can then read the information and then check, okay, for this topic, what is the kind of a structure that we are gonna be receiving? And then we can use that schema that can be then retrieved from the registry to use that for the serializing information that it's coming. So in this way, the schema registry becomes your central piece of truth. And you can also even apply certain you know, validations. Like you won't be able to send any message if you uh, are not compliant with the actual expected version because you know there are consumers that are expecting certain fields. If they don't receive those fields, then it, it, it can break. So it's very important to have this piece of software. And what are the capabilities of uh, expected for this kind of software? Well, you need to be able to you know, handle and manage your artifacts. You need to be able to handle different type of data formats because you know, for some teams, Avro it's fine, but some teams find JSON schemas more, um, more useful and such. And important, remember with APIs, we need to do versioning because uh, your APIs might change and your schemas might change when you are doing a change to your data. So it is super important to be able to handle this uh, kind of versioning uh, approach. So the use case of, of, your, of your registry can also be expanded be, beyond just, uh, just the schema registry. So schema registry is you know, one of the most common uh, use case, but because we're talking about you know, um, leveraging the uh, knowledge of the contract first approach, also for even driven APIs, your registry can also be uh, should be able to use to be used as a, a storage place where you can uh, you know have your API designs uh, there. And when you have your designs and your APIs already in the same registry, just not just for even driven APIs, but also for um, for uh, REST APIs, then you can leverage things like, for example, shared data types. As we remember in the example that I just show for the user registration, the information that it's captured to register for the, for, for the user, it's gonna be the exact same thing that it's gonna be um, used for the event that it's being created. 
And this has been uh, uh, a topic that is coming into also the Cloud Native Com uh, Computer Foundation as part of the, uh, the work that the Cloud Events team is doing around these uh, specific topics. So I want to um, leave you this uh, bookmarks if you want to get started with, we, with the components that we are using within Red Hat. Uh, you can uh, check the links. Uh, you can start working with MQ streams for free if you go to red.ht slash Kafka and get started with uh, this information. So um, thank you very much for your time. I think, Patrick, you have some questions from, from the team. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Yeah, thanks, uh, Hugo. So um, I think I, I want to ask some quite question, and then especially in the past years. Uh, last year, we also heard about the async API, and then there's some discussion on that one. And then some common question I heard from the community is that um, quite a lot of people here is get used to the REST API and also open API in uh, specifications. So um, they, load, they load the pain point, but when they uh, try to put it in the patterns, do you have uh, one or two tips or common mistake that you can see when those people with a strong uh, open API specification mindset, when they try to adapt their event-driven API or async API, do you have one or two common mistake or suggestion for our audience to bear in mind? Sure, yes. One of the things that I that I just uh, learned after you know, playing in both sides of the, of, of the spectrum is that uh, most of, uh, of what I heard from customers and users is that the, they, they raise this, this question on, do I need to use REST API or do I need to use even driven APIs? And my answer most of the times is you certainly will need both because your, the way you handle your data, most of the times will have both type of natures on, on the consumption side and the way you communicate your, uh, your application. So uh, don't try to go into you know, this, uh, this fork between using one or, or, or the other. Most of the times you will need to use both, and and it's it's important to not become you know uh, focus on just one single type and you know drop the uh, the other as uh, or discard it because you will need to uh, to be able to share the information in in, in both ways. So um, don't focus too much into just one. Try to embrace both at the same times, and you will be seeing that most of them share the exact same uh, requirements and you will be able to use the, the knowledge that you already have when using OpenAPI to then translate most of that knowledge into even driven APIs because you will find that when, that you, when you take that as, uh, as, as in the same way, it will become easier and easier to start consuming those. Um, on, on the developer side, uh, it's important to also get advantage of all the tooling that it's now uh, being created. So in the REST API, you will certainly find a lot of tooling already uh, out there in the market. Well, you will certainly hear about those. Uh, in the um, in the Kafka space and even driven APIs, they are start to you know work on, on more tooling. So don't don't get uh, frustrated with that. Uh, there are certainly new companies uh, trying to bring some of these features. You will certainly hear from hear from them here or in other events. So um, don't get frustrated, it will become better. And it certainly will uh, will be able to, to help you to go in this journey. Hmm. So um, another question here is that, um, so it, we talk about the governance. So uh, some, some sometimes we were also trying to say, how can we better monitor or maybe how to uh, do the better observability, et cetera. So uh, when we come to the event driven API, do you see any uh, differences or uh, what is your suggestion? If someone already have a well at that bridge uh, monitoring structure, how can they um, actually um, change your mindset or even um, help on monitoring the event driven API? Do you have one or two suggestions here? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that we have been using uh, in some cases is um, open tracing. So Jagger and, and this kind of toolings are also pliable to the clients, uh, producers and consumers. We have some limitations because um, Jagger and these kind of things are not, you know, well suited for things like uh, fan out, like, you know, uh, multicast or where you need to uh, have several consumers because it was mainly um, something that was focusing on HTTP connections that are just um, uh, point to point. So uh, that's something uh, that we need to overcome and, and, and get um, solved. 
So in that way we can improve, but uh, there are certain tools that can be used to uh, still track the information. But most of the times it will be certainly uh, very uh, implementation uh, led and, mm -hmm. and depending on what you use as a broker, it will give you the, the metrics that you will be able to use for your um, monitoring and uh, observability. Yep. Okay. Thank, uh, thanks, Hugo, for the uh, for, for the uh, question and, and answer. So uh, we use thanks for sharing and then looking forward to see you again as, uh, later. Yep. Thanks. Anytime. Thank you, thank you very much, Patrick, for the invite. Okay. Okay. Thank you.